Hey folks, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game, or sometimes the expansion to a game, such as the case right now with Star Wars Rebellion Rise of the Empire. Now, Star Wars Rebellion was already a huge game, so you might understandably be a little concerned about adding more stuff to it. Well, there are a few new things, mostly inspired by the movie Rogue One, which provides a great prologue into Rebellion's timeline, but the majority of the expansion is actually about replacing parts of the original with updated cards and mechanics. The biggest change is in the combat system, but we're going to get to that later. For now, let's jump right in and learn more about the basic alterations that Rise of the Empire brings to the table. So first off, there are a few cards that have been updated, so find them in the base set and replace them with the new versions. Once you've done that, setup of the game has changed a bit. There's some cool new units, we'll talk about those later, but place them in either your neatly arranged unit formation or your garbage pile of ships, however you like to do things. Both sides will have new starting units, so check the rules for what's different. And the biggest change is that the Empire doesn't start with a fully built Death Star anymore. Instead, the Death Star will be placed on Space 3 of the build queue, and you get a Death Star under construction, which you can place in any remote system, along with four TIE Fighters and a Stormtrooper. But make sure to remove the corresponding probe card from the probe deck. Next, because the Rebels get some new objective cards, we're going to randomly set up their deck. This gives the objective deck even more variety each time you play. So, we need five cards in each stage, but stages two and three need to have a Death Star Plans card. So set one aside for those, build each stage accordingly, and end by drawing the top card. Next up, we have a whole new deck of mission cards that you can use. In order to use these cards, you have to remove all of the old mission cards that don't show a leader, and then add all of the cards that show the Darth Vader icon. These new cards aren't better or worse per se, they're just different. Now, it's recommended that you use the new set on your first game with the expansion, but after that, at the start of every game, each player can choose which mission set they will use, the original or the expansion. When building your mission deck, just remember that the leader mission cards will always remain, as well as the subversion cards, which are added to both sets for both factions. The Empire's project cards get a few new cards, but they're going to be the same no matter which set you choose. All right, let's talk about some of that new stuff. Those ships, those tanks, that shield bunker. Each side has a lot of cool new toys to play with, some of which are a little more complicated than others, but they aren't too hard to figure out. Let's start with this new green die that we're seeing on these new reference sheets. As you can see, there's a lot of blank sides, but the two that aren't blank are direct hits, which makes these units a little more versatile, if a fair bit less effective. What makes them worth it is that these three green dice are rolled in addition to the up to 10 combat dice you were allowed to roll before. Now some, like the TIE Striker or the Nebulon B Frigate, are pretty self-explanatory, but others require a bit of explanation, namely the Interdictor and the Shield Bunker. Like the Super Star Destroyer and Death Star, Interdictors require Imperial Project cards to build. The card will tell you how that works, and then as soon as they're on the board, whenever you get in a fight, so long as the Interdictor is in combat, the Rebels can't retreat. It's very powerful, but it also has a huge target on its back, so keep that in mind. Now the Shield Bunker is even sneakier. Its main function is to protect a Death Star or Death Star under construction. When either of those are in the same system as a Shield Bunker, they can't be destroyed and are immune to the Death Star Plans card, so the Rebels will need to bring along ground forces and destroy it before taking on those big scary danger eggs. Another aspect of the Bunker is how it deals with deployment. First off, it can be deployed onto any system, including remote ones, so long as it contains at least one Imperial unit and no Rebel units. And then, on subsequent rounds, Imperial units can be deployed to that system as if it were a loyal system. Now, it's not just new units, there are also new leaders as well. You've got all the favorites like Choke Boy, Force Dad, and this one. You'll notice that they all have these small skill icons. These are minor skills. They still count towards the minimum number of skills needed to attempt a mission, but if the mission is contested, for each minor skill, you're going to roll a green die. And again, these are in addition to the maximum red and black dice you'll roll, so they might come in handy. Along with these new leaders is a new rule about leaders in general. Namely, if you ever have more than eight leaders in your leader pool, which does occasionally happen, you'll have to choose a leader to remove from the game. And you won't get them back if you lose one of your other leaders later on, so choose wisely. Last up are two quick new bits, immediate objectives and target markers. Sometimes the rebels will draw an objective that says immediate, when this happens, the player must immediately reveal it and resolve its ability. Now let's say this card is revealed, which creates two target markers. When this happens, find the matching marker and place it in two acceptable systems. If a player has ground units on a target marker planet and no enemy ground units are present, they may remove the target marker. 
In this case, that would gain the rebellion some reputation, so the Imperials will want to protect it instead of removing it. All right, so we're almost done. All we've got left is the new cinematic combat rules. Okay, so combat has some new stuff and it also has some big changes. First things first, remember those old tactic cards? Get rid of them. We got bigger, better cards now. Instead of a random pile you draw from at the beginning of combat, each side has their own decks of eight cards each, one for space and one for ground. At the beginning of each round of space and ground combat, both players must choose one card from their respective decks and reveal them at the same time. These cards have two effects that you can choose from. The bottom effect is generic, while the top effect requires you to have at least one of the matching units in the system in order to trigger it. The attacker's card triggers first, unless the defender's card cancels the attacker's. In this case, because we have more Imperial fighters than there are Rebel fighters, we can deal two damage however we want. As before though, units with enough damage to destroy them won't be removed until the end of the combat round. After the cards have been played, they'll be placed in a discard pile and you won't get them back until you've played all of your other cards, which will likely only happen once or twice throughout the game. Now, the addition of these cards obviously changes how a few of the other game mechanics work. First off, the combat values on leaders no longer affects card draw. Instead, these values allow you to re-roll dice in each theater of combat. So Wedge here could re-roll up to three dice during space combat and one during ground. But you have to choose and re-roll all of your dice at once. You can't re-roll the same die multiple times. Another big change is the special die phase. See, tactic cards don't require these dice anymore because you play the cards before you roll the dice. And you can't use them to draw new cards. So instead, when you roll a special, you can spend it to remove one damage counter from a damaged chip whose health matches the color of the die, sometimes saving it from being destroyed, other times filling you with unspeakable rage. This means going second in combat is a little more valuable than going first, which is why some tactic cards allow you to shift the order around. Lastly, if an in-game ability allows a player to draw tactic cards, they instead choose that many cards from their discard pile and return them to their tactic deck. The shield generator's ability, for example, takes effect immediately before players choose their ground tactic cards. So over the course of several rounds, you could theoretically pull and play the same card over and over again. So that's it for the Rise of the Empire. I think it makes combat a lot more interesting and I really appreciate the added variability it brings to each game. Before I go, I wanna give a big thanks to all my rules lawyers who are watching this a month before the rest of you. I mean, you guys are behind the times, so maybe check out my Patreon where you can vote on what games I teach and get exclusive videos like this one a month early. And then there's all the YouTube stuff like subscribing and liking the video and all the stuff that you know to do already, but sometimes you forget, and that's okay. I accept you. I don't know how to end this one. So I guess we'll just do that. Do this. This, this is going way too long.